My name is David. I'm the pastor here. If this is your first time we haven't met, so glad to be a part of this community in moments like these. So, have you ever been given a gift that changed your world? Ever been given a gift that changed your world? So, I was about 10 years old, and it was at Christmas, and we were around the tree, and my sisters got gifts, I got gifts, and then the gifts stopped. And I got to admit, my playlist was a little short. Like, I felt like I didn't quite get all the gifts I was expecting, but I didn't want to show greed to my parents, you know what I mean? So on my face, I was just grateful. <laughs> but then my father said, David, that you have one more gift. And I got so excited. And he goes, it's in the den. And I, and I shot to the den, and I started throwing pillows around and looking through blankets, and there it was, my parents' old stereo. They gave me the gift of music. I could listen to Casey Kasem, AM, or FM, anytime I wanted. I had the tape player, and I just, like, it changed my world, and I just had control of my music. And I know, I know for you guys, that you can't even conceive not even having control of your music, but, but that was a big deal back then for us. It was, it was huge, and so I listened to... Kiss and Def Leppard and Christian music, too, because I was a Christian. But <laughs> I, I listened to, of course, Michael Jackson. You know, it was incredible. And when I really was angry at my mom, I listened to a little bit of Ozzy Osbourne just to stick it to her, you know. <laughs> I was a teenager growing up in the 80s. And, and that was a gift that changed my world. And the reason I, I tell you this is because... We're going through a series called 33 AD, and we're at the last days of Jesus, and Jesus is with his disciples, and he's talking to them, and he's telling them, there's one more gift. Before he goes, this is the conversation that would change their world. This is the gift that will change our world. I'm going to talk to you about it. And chapter 16. Now, I want to give you a little bit of context because in the Last Supper, as Jesus is explaining these conversations to the disciples, they've already been disappointed because he's told them already bad news. See, Jesus, they thought, would set up an earthly kingdom and he would be the Messiah King and he would rule and they would rule with him and everything was looking really great until he starts breaking the news. No, it's a kingdom not of this world. And I'm going away. In fact, they're going to kill me, he says. And so they just get that news. They're trying to let it sink in that he's abandoning them. And he's having this conversation. In John chapter 16, verse 2, it says, They will put you out of the synagogue. The plot thickens. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this. So that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. But very truly, in verse 7, it says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And then he goes down to verse 33. At the end of the conversation, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, could you imagine the angst of the disciples as they're listening to them, to him explain that he's just told them that he's going to leave, that he's going to be killed. But then he says, anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. So if I'm a disciple, I'm checking out right there. Anyone who, kill, anyone who kills you, like as in me? So now... It gets worse. 
What's worse than your leader telling you I'm going to leave and they're going to kill me is and they're going to kill you too. That's what's worse. And so now in their confusion and hurt, Jesus says something very peculiar in verse 7. He says, but very truly I tell you. In other words, pay attention. When he's saying very truly, he says, no, no, this is really true. I need you to focus. I need you to, to pay attention. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Hell, what can be better than you, Jesus? I mean, how can this be better for us that you are going away? You, after all, taught us to walk on water. You fed the 5,000. You, you took care of the religious bullies. Like, you are the man. You walk with, you, you, you've shown us to walk with God in your presence. We, we understand who God is. You, what can be better than you? This advocate better be a big deal. And he's, he's telling them that it's better for them that he leave. That this advocate, this advocate will make all the difference in their life. This is the gift that will change their world. He, the advocate, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence and the power of God in you. And it's pretty incredible. So I'm going to take a risk right now. If you have opened your life to who God is some point in your life, and you believe you contain the Holy Spirit, would you please stand? I'm just asking you, just, just humor me. Just, just stand. You believe that you actually contain God. Okay, great. Please be seated. I want you to know that you are possessed by a ghost. I wanted to get t-shirts made for middle school, in fact. It was, it was going to say, uh, I am possessed by a ghost. Ask me about him. Right? But I figured I'd get in trouble, and I don't really do Christian t-shirts. But it's, it's a crazy idea that we, have to wrap, we try to wrap our minds around that we actually contain, possess a holy ghost. The Holy Spirit. And the disciples had to be trying to understand what this meant. How could all of who God is fit inside of them, after all? In the Jewish mind, God dwelled with his people. He dwelled with the Jewish people in what was called a tent of meetings. And the Jewish people, when they were going through the desert, they actually set up a tent and they built it based on his instruction of how God would meet with his people. And there was, yes, a, an Ark of the Covenant, yes, an Indiana Jones Ark of the Covenant that they would put there. And there was actually cherubim, which I don't have time to explain, but basically it formed a mercy seat, yes, a chair for God. And in that space, the cloud or the glory or the presence and the power of God would sit and would converse with his people. In, a, in fact, they were nomadic, and in a very real sense, God was nomadic with his people. He went from place to place, from neighborhood to neighborhood, and he, he resided with the people of Israel. He resided with his people in that space, and it went from a, his presence went from a tent to a temple. And they finally landed in a place. And they built a temple. And he stayed in the temple. And the cloud of the glory of God and his presence dwelled in the temple that Solomon built. And he, he stayed with his people. And, of course, they worshipped foreign gods. And he had the temple destroyed. So then he, was, he moved on. And he foretold of a presence. He, his presence went from tent to temple to flesh and blood in Jesus. And so now Jesus was the temple made of flesh and blood. And Jesus was God who dwelled among people. And there he was. And he was with them. And he was with the disciples. And they were, he was proving constantly that he was God among them. And they couldn't believe it. It was, it was 
It was this crazy idea. And then he was trying to explain a mystery to them. It went from tent to temple to his flesh and blood, now to our flesh and blood. He would dwell for the first time inside of us. He would be closer than we could ever imagine. We would never, ever believe that we were alone. If you stood up, you, you believe that you carry the living God inside your body. Is it just me <laughs> who thinks that's crazy? I need to stop screaming. It's just, it's, it's mind-boggling to me, but this mystery is spoken of in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. It says, in verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. That would be us, unless you're Jewish. The glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everything beautiful is displays God's glory. Everything you've experienced while living that was glorious, that it was beautiful, it was displaying God's glory. Everything that relates to him displays his glory. But the hope of glory in your life was Christ in you through the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing reality that his spirit would bring us to glory, that we are, our lives would actually turn beautiful. He's telling them of a gift that would change the world. We are his dwelling place. Isn't that amazing? The gift that would change our world is his presence in us, and it means a few things. One is... You're no longer alone. What the disciples feared is that he, they were being abandoned by him, that they would face death alone. I mean, isn't that the thing that we fear, that we would, we would just end up alone? That in the struggle, that we're the only ones? We're the only ones who struggle with this, that there's nobody else that can understand the pain we're in or have suffered the way we've suffered or could have these Issues that will never leave us alone. The brokenness of our own life that we're alone. But this, this moment where he gives us the Holy Spirit, where he tells us he's with us, we are never alone. And the bitter pill that they were trying to swallow is that they were going to be alone, but he is with us. But he says, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. He is our advocate in times of trouble. When he tells them he was going away, he uses the word advocate. The advocate would come and replace him. And advocate is an interesting word because it's, it actually means advocate, ad voice, vocate. It comes from that Latin root of just being another voice, a stronger voice like a lawyer who speaks on your behalf but has more influence and more power in public. They're an advocate for you. They're a second voice. See, when he was doing this, he was giving us a second voice inside of us. And many times what I've seen with Christians is that we believe there's just one voice. It's our voice. Our own conscience, our own mind. That we presuppose separation as if God is out there and we're still doing all the things to try to please him out there. We're not accessing the power of who he is. But we have a, a second voice that guides us. And we have the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit and I don't know if you felt the Holy Spirit today. We don't even use that language here at Mosaic a lot. But I felt him. And, and, and by the way, it's, it's also not an it, it's a him. He's not an energy or a fuel or a, a power. He is God. But can we be honest for just a moment? 
about the, your Holy Spirit. I mean, just real talk for just a moment. Like, hypothetically, like if we, if we were at a party and we met God in all his fullness, that means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and maybe we're, we're meeting him, them, him, like we're meeting him, right? And everything we understand of who he is is partly by the scripture, but a lot by the faith community at large. And so there's the Father. We see the Father. Well, so we start with the Son because we're most comfortable with him. Jesus, yes. Jesus, I love you. It's so good. I'm so glad you came to the party. I love you. Oh, my gosh, we're tight. I, I'm so, I love you. Thank you for loving me and for sacrificing everything for me. He's like, let me introduce you to my Father. Great. I'm a little nervous, but yes. Okay. Yep. Oh, and there's the Father. Yes, sir. Yes. I am so grateful. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for loving me. Yes, we're good. And then he's like, well, there's the Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay. Holy Spirit, if we just looked at the way the church at large has portrayed the Holy Spirit, here's my impression of the Holy Spirit at a party. He never speaks any language that I could understand. He doesn't speak. And the, and the people keep telling me what he says that I don't know and I don't trust. And he's there with his favorites. He's there, and they're all so filled. They're having this great time in a party, and I didn't get invited because I don't know the language. I don't, I'm, I'm there, and I don't understand. And then he straight up knocks people out. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to be buddies. I, I don't, I just, I'm, I'd, I'd rather kind of leave it alone. Let me hang with Jesus, Father, Son, and you kind of like, We'll get this on the other side of eternity. You'll explain him to me. Anyone? I mean, does anyone understand that? It's, it's we many times either ignore it because it gets complicated or we don't really understand the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, it's very different. He actually describes the Holy Spirit in his presence. See, any time, the fact that you and I have a relationship with God at all is because the Holy Spirit actually convinced you. The Holy Spirit is the one who gave you understanding. It's not just that he, just, he speaks languages you don't understand. No, no. He speaks the language of your heart. He speaks the language of your heart, and he's the one. He is the one who convinced you of your sin. He is the one who convinced you what was wrong. He convinced you what was right. He helps you understand that you need forgiveness because what you had before Jesus was what the world has. You knew blame and you knew shame. You knew how to, to blame everything else for the reason you are a mess. Well, it's my parents, and you pay a lot of money to get that. You, under, you learn that. Of course, it's my parents, my family. That's why I'm the way I am. You know, it's my family, it's my ethnicity, it's my biology, it's, it's, I know how to blame everything for the mess that I'm in. This is, this is what, I, what I know how to do, and if it's not blame, then it's shame. It's not, it's not just that I do awful things, it's that I am an awful thing. And I don't know if I, there's any hope for me. I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of this cycle, this, this plague, this Dark routine that keeps stealing my life. Am I, am I just rotten to the core? I know what it is to play the, pl the blame and the shame game until the Spirit of God, the other voice, comes and he leads me out. And he teaches me about forgiveness. I need forgiveness. Oh, I just... I just have guilt. I just, I'm carrying this guilt like weight and I need it to be released. That's why in 1 John 1 9, he says, If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When I had the pleasure of talking to the people who were being baptized, I was just saying, Hey, let me start with what baptism is not. It's not like super water or holy water. Like it's not going to actually cleanse you of any sin. So do that yourself. And the way you do that yourself is you just, you agree with God what God's been telling you because the Holy Spirit will tell you. He will guide you into all truth. He won't play games. He won't like, hey, I'm going to let you try to figure it out. There's something wrong, but I'm not going to tell you. No, no. The Holy Spirit actually proves the world 
right about, wrong about sin and righteousness. So what's right and what's wrong? What's, what's, what's wrong? He tells you what's wrong. Aren't you glad? He doesn't play games. He just tells me, oh, that's what it is. I'm angry at my wife, and I need to forgive her, and I need to humble myself. And he just, like, he gives it to us. He tells us what's wrong, what our sin is. And he proves what's wrong and right because he knows my heart. In John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, he says more about this. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. You know what's beautiful about this? Two things. One is the Holy Spirit is telling you what Jesus is saying to you. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. If you want to know what Jesus is saying, the only way you can know is the Holy Spirit is telling you what Jesus is saying. So you can trust him. But also this, he will not speak on his own. He will, only, he will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to, yet to come. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will tell you what is yet to to come. You know what those are? Those are like visions and ideas and dreams. Like he's, he's, those just aren't, those are, are, are not just yours. God is like downloading ideas. And I love this. I see this all the time at Mosaic. You know, you don't necessarily connect the dots, but when you join our community, because it's a vision culture, in other words, the Holy Spirit moves among us, and as he does, he whispers dreams to you, dreams about your company, dreams about your family, dreams about your life, dreams about your kids, dreams about the possibilities, the, of the new things and things that you're going to have, and you don't, you may not realize that you are in an environment of inspiration, inspiration, inspirited life. And your life gets better and you take more risk in your life because he's telling you things to come. He's speaking to you new dreams, giving you the future that you're going to create. Isn't that amazing? So, so the Spirit is speaking, but we may not be able to hear all truth because we've learned how to listen to ourselves too much. So I had a ski instructor. We went as a staff to, to um, go skiing. And of course, I've never gone skiing, uh, ever. I've, I don't think I've even gone water skiing. I just, I went skiing for the first time and I thought, I'm going to master the bunny slope, man. I'm going to master it. Pfft. Ain't nobody going to hit the bunny slope like me. You know, like, low goal, right? So I, I'm with Bob, let's just call him Bob, you know. I'm with Bob, the, the ski instructor. And Bob is an amazing skier and a horrible instructor. <laughs> Bob keeps yelling at me at all the things I'm doing wrong. And, and I, I'm like, this isn't really working. I'm getting nervous, you know. Like, I knew it was a bunny slope, but I could get hurt here, you know. And so I'm there, and I notice all my friends leave me. They all would rather try and go on their own and possibly kill themselves and listen to Bob. That's how bad he is. So, so they, they leave me, and it's just me and Bob. And Bob has to pull out the stick. Not to hit me, but there's a, there's a stick now because I'm so bad. He's like, okay, it's like a flagpole. He's like, hold on to this, you know, <laughs> idiot. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going, and I'm, now I've got the stick. I feel like a toddler on a stick, you know, with Bob. <laughs> and <laughs> three-year-olds are... <laughs> Passing us by, 90-year-old, you know, it's just going, and I'm just like, how's it going? Yeah. Um, and it, it's not working, I'm not doing really well, and then I, I do something, I actually turn the volume down on Bob's voice, and I, I have this idea, I think it was from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit says, just watch his feet, just don't listen, watch his feet, and I just start imitating, I start moving 
as he's moving. And I'm, I'm, I'm gliding, I'm moving. And, you know, I just once in a while peek and listen to his voice. And he's starting to be positive. I'm like, okay, this is good. Now shut that down. And just go. I'm actually getting better. See, I have a capacity to learn that I didn't know I had. It's a different way of knowing. And so many of us are like that. We listen to our own voice that's dominantly negative. Telling us all the other things. But guess what? The advocate means add voice. It's another voice that speaks to you. And if the only voice you're listening to is Bob the instructor, if the only voice you're listening to is yourself, you're not going to do well. But if you can switch gears and listen to the voice that's advocating for your future, if you can learn to just see what God is doing, in you and around you, you have the capacity, but you may not be using it. The capacity to hear God's voice, it's a beautiful option for us. This is the gift of the, the presence of God. That we would not only know what we're doing wrong, but we would know what we're doing right. I have a friend who's coming alive right now. I, I love watching his life, and we're going through the scriptures together, and he, he's telling me of things that are happening in his life. For him, it's no big deal. It's just like normal things. But for me, I'm like, this is obviously like the spirit of God moving in his life. And he, he says, I'm, 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 I talked to a client, and she was late, and she said that she... She just broke down in tears. She's in the middle of a divorce, just having a horrible, horrible time, and she was apologizing, and he just, he just said, hey, uh, can I pray for you? And she goes, yes, and he, he prays for her and says amen, and they hang up, and she texts him and reaches out to him to say, that was so meaningful. Thank you so much. And, and, I, and I just said, well, what, what did you used to do in a situation like that? And he said, I, I would just tell her, like, oh, okay, well, we can schedule another time. Get yourself together, and then we'll schedule another time because it's business, right? This is just a little example of how the Spirit of God speaks to you. It's so small you might miss it. But he had an option to either do what he thought was good business and what he'd learned from other people, or he was going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to be human with a person, to exercise kindness, and to take a risk. Jesus, he doesn't just give us the presence of the Holy Spirit. He, he teaches us what's, what we do wrong, what we do right. When you actually, how, how do you know when you're doing right? Well, the Spirit of God will actually fill you. You will be inspired. You will know this is what my life is supposed to be about as you step in into the world. And this is why it's so important. See, Jesus didn't just come to give us the gift of his presence, but Jesus came to give us the gift of his power. Of his power. It's not enough to just have his presence. You had to experience his power. And that's why it's sandwiched in between two harsh realities in this conversation. Jesus is saying... When they kill you, to the disciples, when they kill you, they will think that they're doing a gift from God, but that's because they just don't know me or my father. So he's, he starts with really bad news, and then he ends with really bad news, and he says in verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. See, the disciples were explained about the Holy Spirit not in a prayer circle, not in a worship service. No, they were explained the Holy Spirit in a war room. They were explained that we have a mission, a purpose, something that's going to lead you into the trouble. Let me tell you, if you follow the Spirit of God, he will lead you into trouble. If you live by faith, you're going, to be all, you're going to be in a mess of trouble. But guess what? Even if you don't, you're in trouble anyway. Trouble finds you. The difference is you will have trouble without meaning, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit. When you follow the Holy Spirit, you'll lead in trouble. You get to choose. Don't you want to choose your own trouble? 
Isn't it better to just to choose your own trouble, to step into things that actually cost you, that, that are hard for you, knowing that he is the other voice advocating for you? This is the experience of the power of God in your life. The God in you, the Holy Spirit, is bent on rescuing a fallen world. That's what he was telling his disciples. In this world, you will have trouble, not because the world is the enemy, because there is a prince of this world that is the enemy. We are not here to judge the world. We're here to serve the world. And he's got this, this, this passage, so he talks about sin and righteousness now and judgment, which is maybe our favorite thing at times. Judgment. He says about judgment. In verse 11, and, and about judgment, he says, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I just can't get around that. I mean, the Holy Spirit teaches us not to judge the world, but to judge the prince of this world. Did you know that you stand in judgment against the evil one? Did you know that the power of the Holy Spirit means he stands condemned? And the Holy Spirit gives us understanding that there is nothing that can defeat you. That in the end, we win. That everything that is happening is moving towards our victory. We stand against no one more powerful in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's saying the... the evil one, the prince of this world, stands condemned. So whatever you go through, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are not coming against the world. We are coming to rescue the world. We are rescue workers. And when you carry God inside of you, you carry the greatest rescue worker that ever existed on the planet. And guess what? He is bent on rescuing a fallen world. He's bent on it. He, as a Holy Ghost, if you're not living in that, he will haunt you about it. Something will be off. You will feel as if you have plenty of spiritual practices, but no spiritual power in your life. The power of the Holy Spirit is when we are sharing our story, how our lives have been changed by him, the beauty of who he is, the power of what he's doing in our life. We have him going to the world. There is no other agenda who Jesus was. He is in us. That's why he's a Holy Spirit, a set apart spirit, a different spirit, an other spirit, someone far above the world to bring rescue, and we carry his life, but we experience his life as we give our lives to rescue those in darkness without him. This is this is why Jesus was so excited. Guys, the news is so good. It's very truly, I'm telling you, I've got great news. You will experience a life you could not imagine inside of Jesus. He, he cannot be destroyed. As your working and living in your life as he leads you by his spirit. <laughs> he produces in you all these beautiful things not for you, but for others to see you, to see God in you. And he leads us into all truth and we are, we are people of the truth. We are people who, who walk in this world and we, we prove the world wrong about what sin is. It's, it's not living in the center. 
your own world, but letting Jesus be the center. He is the center. <clears throat> What's true when we, when we speak to someone, we tell them our story. There was a, another friend of mine two weeks ago who said, you know, I was telling my friend about, about Mosaic, and they were telling me, they're very, they're very spiritual. They, they, don't, they don't really know about Jesus, but they're very spiritual. And, they, and, and she told me about her story, and he, he said, you know what, I told him about my story, about, about how Jesus has changed me, and how Mosaic has is doing that in my life. And you know what? Like, he was shocked. Like, she was really open to it. She was interested in it. She was, she was amazed by it. And I was just like, well, how'd you feel? Did you feel powerful? Because that is the power of God. As we share who he is in our life, do you share your faith story? Do you share your faith story? We live in a culture where there are two holes. There's, there's a hole where people in the world are just having a party, and they're great. And we need to leave them alone. Let them, let them party. God bless them. But there's another hole, and these are, these are people desperate to get out of this hole. Now, it is wrong to impose our views and on the people in the hole who are having a party. They're what Jesus called the healthy. They're good. But it is also wrong to look at the people in the hole desperately trying to come out, overwhelmed with anxiety and depression, and they, they, they can't find a reason for their life, and us not tell them you're in a hole. It is wrong to do that. You must speak the truth and grab a hold and let them know I am sent by God to tell you you are not born to live in this hole. That is the truth. You're wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. There is a prince of darkness who controls this world and he's already condemned. Get off of his team and join the team God. Be a part of the future. It's filled with life. Your key to the kingdom is your story. It doesn't mean that you're supposed to be a preacher. It just means a storyteller. He said in Acts 1-8, that you be my witnesses, not my preachers. You be my witnesses. A witness is someone who God has impacted, and you were there. You saw it. You were impacted by it. You be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. If you tell your story, then people are listening hear their story, tell your story. They'll hear his story. You know why? Because it will no longer be your voice. It would be the second voice, the advocate. He will be speaking. You are not here to convince anyone. The spirit who convinced you will convince them. They will move. So I was given the gift of music when I was given a, a stereo, but but I was also given a piano. And I realized that I really enjoyed playing piano and I, I realized that I actually could create music and, and play music and, and not only hear and listen to the music, but I could play music and create beautiful moments. And I gave actually concerts in college and I even got this radio contest I was a part of and I was creating music at one time in my life and I was creating all of this beautiful all these beautiful things in my life. And it is so, it is a tragic thing if you were a musician and all you did for the rest of your life was listen to music. God has designed us to bring music to the world. That's how He's designed us. And the Holy Spirit, that's. He is all you need to lean into the future. He is the one who's going to change everything in your life. But you still have to be that first voice for him to be the second. He will be the advocate, and you will live in miracle. Let's be that, church. Let's pray together. If you're here and this makes sense to you and somehow for the very first time you decided to take your hands off of your life and say, Jesus, 
if you've done this for me, that you, that if you've given your life for me, that I could experience this kind of life. And you could pull me out of this hole, Jesus. Well, I want that in my life. See, Jesus came 2,000 years ago and did indeed die and rose again and lives today. And you experience what you're experiencing is the advocate, the Holy Spirit, convincing you that this is true in a way that you can't logically make sense of it. That's why it's a mystery. But the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you now and telling you there's so much life ahead. If that's you, you like to take your hands off your life, perhaps for the first time, and offer your entire life to Jesus. It's just a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. It's that simple. It's not all you and God have to talk about, but it's the opening of your life to him. Jesus, I give you my life. If that's you, you pray that prayer right now. I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you in this moment. Anyone? Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyone else? Just take beautiful. Jesus, I pray for those who've given their lives to you, Lord. It couldn't be a better decision today. Thank you for bringing life to us and showing us the way. Lord, I pray that they would be swallowed up in your love and you would help them build new friendships to bring life to them. And they would join the movement that brings life to the world. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we thank God for decisions that were made today? Listen. I know, I know Pastor Andres has talked about this, but I just want to echo the words of what's going to happen on May 21st. That it is, it is the eternal manifested in the physical. We have a lot of beautiful things ahead, and we are. It's, it is our sacrifice and our giving in the 30th anniversary of the three that I want you to pray about. I want you to think about what you're going to give to build the future. It's only between you and God. But if you are obedient to him, if you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, it will open up new things for you that you could not believe. I love being part of this community. I love that we're actually changing the world with the gift of God. God bless you guys.